Hello everyone. So today in this session, we will share with you the Salesforce journey to migrate to Snowflake and how we are leveraging Snowflake and some other technologies to build the next generation architecture. Uh, myself, Vikas Sangwan. I lead the data engineering and data platform for Salesforce and I'm my friend with me. Uh, I'm Murali Kalem and I lead the uh, data platform at Salesforce. So we'll focus on four main areas today. We'll share with you where we were earlier, what were some of the pain points we had, and where we want to go, and how we are leveraging Snowflake and some of the other key technology for our next generation platform. Along with that, we will also share some of the things about our migration journey, like how we involve Snowflake services, our SI partners, and some of the things which we feel are very helpful for any kind of migration. Finally, we are not looking at this platform just for technology change. We are looking for this uh, platform and Snowflake as a catalyst for enabling the business team for the self-service. So we'll share our journey with you about how we are enabling the business for the self-service using the data franchisee concept. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, so folks, Vikas is gonna cover uh, where we are going, how we are modernizing, and all those fun and fancy stuff. And I'm stuck with where we were what the pain points were. So call me Debbie the Donner for the next two minutes, okay? Um, so let me share where we were. Um, this is a view of our uh, you know, ecosystem. Our um, data platform is built for internal users, and a lot of our users are uh, representing functions such as finance, sales, marketing, and so forth. And all our data sources are sourced from internal data systems. And we have about 50 plus of those. We do have some third party data that we bring in as well. And uh, as part of that, we bring in data from ERP and you know, our HR systems and so forth. And we have about 6,000 plus ETL jobs that uh, allow us to uh, ingest the data, transform them, and then ultimately we create about 1,000 plus key business metrics. And we store all of that in enterprise data warehouse that is hosted on-premise. Um, it's hosted on Oracle Exadata appliance. And, um, and you know, it's, it's been uh, facilitating a lot of business operations and so forth. And uh, um, over a period of time, we realized that the needs of the business the scalability and agility needs of the business, we were not able to uh, cater to all of them, uh, we as an IT organization. So we then formed a, a space for them. We call that as a, a self-service slash exploration platform. And, and that's also, it's a separate platform. It's hosted on-premise as well. And, uh, and, and we copied all the data from existing data warehouse to that business exploration area uh, you know, predominantly, you know, the, the data sets that the business needs. Uh, the business users also uh, had their own uh, uh, other data sets needs that were not in the data warehouse. So we brought in, uh, they, they brought in their own data sets, you know, whether it's spreadsheets or their databases and so on and so forth. And um, um, overall, uh, you know, this ecosystem grew over a period of time. We had about, uh, uh, a few hundred users when we started to now about 30,000 users using uh, that platform. And, uh, and, and, and we have about 3,000 people creating uh, pipelines and con dashboards and stuff like that in that platform as well. And um, um, you know, we have about 30,000 dashboards and uh, for dashboarding we use Tableau, uh, which is Salesforce internal tool. And, uh, um, and, and we make that a self-service tool as well. So we have about 25,000 uh, average users um, on a monthly basis that are accessing that uh, Tableau system. So a lot of dashboarding, a lot of self-service happens in that area. Now, you know, you can see this platform grew quite a bit. A um, lot of people are using it, but with it came some pain points. Um, we kind of captured in you know, four streams, but a lot of these pain points are typical to what some of you have experienced uh, in your current or previous jobs. Uh, first and foremost is security and compliance. Um, so our EDW is a SOX system, and so we are asked to provide uh, uh, SOX control verifications and, and, and things like that. 
um, ITGC controls, you know, stuff like that. We, we were not equipped to do those in an automatic manner. We would go, uh, whenever we were asked to provide proofs for, from an auditing perspective and whatnot, we would go pull all those manually, which means our folks had to spend time pulling that information um, through manual steps than focusing on uh, you know, providing business value and things like that. Um, we also had uh, um, data access problem. Um, that, that area had a lot that needed to be done, and uh, you know, there's a high risk of uh, 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 sensitive data falling in wrong hands, and, and we needed to do a lot more on that area. In data management space, we, um, our foundations were somewhat shaky, I would say, um, and we needed to improve that quite a bit. We did not have a data cataloging tool. People did not know what, uh, um, what certain business terms meant, what business metrics meant. So they would make some assumptions, and through those assumptions, maybe that must have driven some business decisions and you know, imagine what that could have uh, led to uh, if that really happened. Um, the trust in data was uh, you know, far out there. I think there's more that needed to be done. And so we had to improve that, and uh, and 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 you know that that's a big pain point for us. Governance, etc. We had some um, challenges there. A lot more to be done. Things were largely not governed or governed to a certain extent, but not to the extent that we want it to be. On the technology side, uh, we gave you a sneak peek of the tooling that we're using, Oracle Exadata. Um, you know, great platform, but from a scalability perspective, it allowed us to scale horizontally, but not necessarily uh, uh, meet the needs of the business users. Um, I don't know if anybody managed Oracle appliances or, or any appliances, Netiza and so forth. You all know getting an appliance takes uh, several months of lead time. You have to go through procurement. You have to go through legal. You know, you have to do all that work and then finally get it into data center and, and power it up. Um, in one of my previous jobs, we had to go through all that. We took it all the way to the data center and found out that they did not have enough power to power those appliances. So that slowed us down for one more month, right? So scalability-wise, we were a little bit uh, uh, behind the curve from what we needed to be providing to the business users. Also, on the, um, uh, our, our architecture um, uh, allowed systems to integrate um, so system to system, and it was not uh, done in a very structured manner, which led to a spaghetti kind of model. So we needed to improve that as well. Overall, um, the business value we are providing was uh, uh, the platform was not easily adaptable for the changing needs of the business, so, and we had to improve that. So let's talk about where we are going. Vikas, you want to take it from there? Thank you. So looking at these uh, pain points, when we start looking at uh, what should be the next generation uh, data platform for us, and we start uh, analyzing how Snowflake can help us for that. Not only we focus on technology value, we also focus on all the three pain points which uh, Murli was highlighting earlier. So when we look at the uh, next generation data platform strategy, we thought about, hey, let's see how we can add value for our business user. And when we talk about the business user, some of our business user are in the sales organization. How we can enable our sales people to increase their ACV realization where they can realize almost 60 million in the next five years. How we can increase not just the scalability of the platform from the technology angle, but how we can give the better performance for the business user. Murli highlighted some of the uh, pain point for the security. Trust is number one priority for uh, Salesforce. So how do we ensure that the data which our user are expecting in the platform, it's very high quality, uh, it has the right governance built in, and it's very secure. Only the right people who need the right data at the right time, they can access it. So these are the some of the business value we focused on. And how we can lower the cost of the legacy system when we are moving into the new system. Murli talked about if you have to buy the appliance. It's not an easy way to buy new appliances and set this up. So that's where Snowflake and some of the architecture principles Snowflake has is going to help us. So from this business value and the pain points, we decide we will focus on six main pillars as part of our next generation beta platform. 
The first pillar is Data Hub. Data Hub is a landing zone in our next generation architecture where all the data come from different source system. And this Data Hub serve as a single source of truth, not just for analytics use case, but also for the operational use case. Everything, all application in our enterprise, if they need to access some data, they go into the Data Hub. We have built the Data API on top of the Data Hub, so it's very easy to consume the data in the applications as well. Once the data is in the Data Hub, it moves to Data Warehouse. That's where we create the business function specific data marts, facts and dimension tables, and we leverage Snowflake, all great capabilities like store once, compute many times. Uh, also the data cloning without any copy. All those features are actually very, very helpful for us in the data hub. The third area, the data exploration platform. This was something which Murli was highlighting in the first slide, the sum of the pain point where we were copying the data manually from our old Exa data into the data exploration area for our business user. Using Snowflake, we don't need to do any of that copy. We are still creating this data exploration platform for our end user, but without any copy. Think of this as a freedom within the framework. They have the freedom to access all the data from the data hub, all the data from the data warehouse, bring their own data from their own source system, but there's a lot of governance built in, there's a lot of automation built in, so that they can do the same exploration in the same way what they have to do in the EDW. And all these three pieces reside in the Snowflake. We augmented this part of the platform with three other pillars. Data is as good as its quality. Data is as good as its consistency. That's where we ensure that we have the right consistency using of the definitions using our master data management. We have the right quality and the quality policy built using our uh, Atacama as a tool for the data quality. And finally, we ensure that all the metadata from the all the enterprise system is stored into the Alation as our go-to place for all the cataloging systems. Finally, uh, you all are aware of the Gen AI uh, and every AI things happening in the world right now. We wanted to make sure this data platform work very well with our data science workbench as well. All the data which our data scientists need to access to make the insight for their business on the timely manner should be available to them. So we decide to use uh, two of the tools here. One is uh, Data IQ, which integrate really well with Snowflake, as well as we use the open source uh, Jupyter Notebooks. The next slide shows the same six pillars into more of a detailed architecture. Uh, I would like to focus on the center, which is the, all the pieces in the Snowflake. Once the data from the source system come into the EDH, uh, which is the data hub, from that it's moved from its different zone into the data warehouse. And finally, all this data is available for the end users whether they want to access through the REST API, they want to use it into their data science workbench tool, or they want to build it the Tableau reports on top of that. And the area which I was highlighting earlier, data exploration platform, you don't need to move the data now. Using the Snowflake uh, architecture, you can access all this data from those two zones into the data exploration directly. Uh, what is shown in the underneath, that was the other pillars I was highlighting in the previous slide. All this data is actually hardened by the strong governance, security, data management, and auditing and monitoring. Salesforce is really big about using our own product, Salesforce on, on Salesforce. So you see here, MuleSoft is our go-to ch choice of tool for any API-based integration. And when it comes for the visualization, we prefer to use uh, Tableau for most of our needs. This is where we envision, so uh, how we will be transforming even our platform in next three to five years. What I was showing on the previous slide, that's the current migration journey. I hope some of you have heard about some of the recent announcement from Salesforce about Data Cloud. That's a new product. And in this product, we are enabling our customer who are using Salesforce, different clouds like Sales Cloud, Marketing Cloud, Service Cloud, to bring that data very easily into the Data Cloud as to get the single source of truth of all this data. And the way we are envisioning data cloud, we envision this data cloud will coexist and interplay with all other data warehouse as well as the data lakes. In fact, our product team and Snowflake product teams are working very closely together to make sure Snowflake and data cloud, you don't have to move the data between them. If you have the data available in uh, Snowflake or you have the data available in data cloud using Iceberg, you should be able to access both of them easily between both of those. So that's the vision we are actually working together for next three years. 
Would we will now talk some of the things about security compliance and data management? Yeah, before I talk, I, I just want to make sure, is the audio okay? Is everybody able to understand? Because um, I could sense we're a little bit muffled. Um, so on the security compliance, I talked about that as a pain point. Um, as we are embarking on uh, modernizing our platform, our pipelines and all that, uh, we wanted to take a fresh look at everything that we do from a security perspective. So we started off with a secure SDLC philosophy, and we are baking that into everything that we are doing. Um, whether we are building, uh, you know, how we are building the platform, we are taking a look at how do we, you know, lock it down uh, from a security perspective. Uh, you know, um, what about uh, um, uh, encryption? And, and we are using Snowflake's encryption mechanisms to, uh, uh, you know, encrypt our data at rest. And all the pipelining that we are doing, we are also encrypting them in transit. So all our data flowing in and staying in within our data platform is, is securitized uh, in, in, in that aspect. Um, we are also um, making sure our secrets are, are properly managed. So we are doing an uplift on uh, how we are managing our secrets. Um, you know, on the data pipeline side, we are um, making sure that we are um, uh, Im implementing the, uh, uh, you know, security aspects while we are building, uh, you know, our code, you know, in our SDLC process. So that's another thing that we are also doing. Um, from a SOX and compliance perspective, we are um, automating quite a lot of things that we were doing, you know, as manual activities. SOX control um, uh, validations, reconciliations, et cetera. We are automating the, those and we are, um, um, you know, um, providing those as uh, uh, readily available insights for whoever needs to, um, you know, from a data quality perspective or control enforcement perspective, all those are readily um, available for folks. On the data access side, this is where we are, uh, um, you know, um, spending a lot of our time. It's a huge problem. Um, I'm sure some of you will agree with me that data access, uh, access to uh, data historically is, was done by IT organizations, and it was mainly looked at access to an application rather than access to the data that sits in, inside it. So, um, and that's a traditional way, uh, traditional IT way of thinking, but we're all data people here. We gotta um, uh, think from a you know, proper data security perspective. So we are um, uh, trying to implement a role-based access control, birthright controls, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So we are leveraging Snowflake's tagging and masking capabilities uh, where we can then uh, bring in the metadata from our data catalog, such as classification, categorization, and so on and so forth, that then allows uh, people to go create these access policies using Snowflake features, as well as what's available in our data catalog. And, and that does provide um, or limit what kind of tables and what kind of fields can be accessed by uh, you know, certain roles. We're then completing our journey um, uh, from an access management perspective, taking it all the way to the identity and access management tools, uh, which allow us to tie what users get access to what roles. So here you have uh, tables and fields, and then you have roles which tell which tables and fields it can access, and then you have users uh, you know, attached to those roles. So that allows us to uh, somewhat lock, lock down the accesses and make sure that we are implementing a, um, a least privileged data access uh, you know, principles as part of that. So that's on the security and compliance side. Uh, I talked about governance and data management, that we needed to lay strong foundations there. Um, so we started that journey several years ago. We picked uh, a data catalog tool, that's Alation, that uh, Vikas was talking about. And um, this data catalog functions as our go-to place for people to go um, uh, discover uh, companies' metadata. Uh, and that metadata includes uh, factors such as uh, uh, business glossary, business terms, business uh, uh, key metrics, uh, what are those definitions, and who are the data owners for those metrics. And, um, and then we at, um, linked Alation to various source systems 
which then brought in all the metadata from those uh, systems, such as tables, fields, you know, and things like that. Now you have all the technical metadata in Alation. And we then built some accelerators. Some of that is still in progress. But we built some accelerators that allowed people to uh, uh, create more metadata and, and then upload into Alation. So now you have additional factors like you know, data classification, who the data owners are, or what's the data handling uh, you know, uh, uh, policies around it, and how long are you going to keep the data, data retention, you know, and things like that. So we're trying to expand that ecosystem to uh, include all of those. Um, so that's, uh, uh, that's helping quite a bit. Uh, we do have a session later today uh, in a theater session. We're going to talk more about uh, that, how we are handling metadata, and so on and so forth. Um, Vikas uh, briefly talked about MDM. We are investing in MDM as well uh, because we have some challenges with master data, mastering the data, making sure our reference data um, and, and hierarchies are able to be managed properly. And, and ultimately, we want a, a single source of truth for some key companies' uh, data. We talked about data quality, how um, the trust of, of the data in the business uh, uh, view was uh, far from desired. So we um, put in efforts to bring in a, a improved data quality. We, first, we brought in an enterprise data quality tool. Uh, we picked Atacama for that. And that allows us to go create and build data quality rules at uh, a, a almost every table and field level. Um, now, whether you want to do that right from the get-go is up to you, but we chose to do it at a critical data elements level so that we are uh, getting a critical mass of uh, data quality for the most trusted fields in the, in the company. So th that's, uh, that's an area that we're uh, investing a lot of time and efforts as well. And, and you know, ultimately, all of this are not going to work if you do not have proper governance set in place. How do you do that? Um, so we started with uh, policy creations, updating those policies, and you know they definitely needed a lot of TLC. So we spent a lot of time in updating those, creating more standards and things like that. But then you also need people to take those and and implement those. So we adopted a uh, while we have a governance team at an enterprise level, we adopted a decentralized governance model where um, you know, business teams, business units, have their own governance functions sitting within their business units, uh, who are then working with their uh, individual data owners um, for those you know, data elements and so forth. The, and then um, they would work with them to make sure that they're, they're basically governing that space properly. So that's uh, 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 one thing that uh, uh, we got going. Um, we, we made good progress, but we have a long way to go on that front. Uh, because why don't you talk about um, the actual migration we're doing? So we know from where we are coming, what was the pain points, and we know where we have to go. But then the question was, how do we go there? Given the level of complexity, which we shows on the first slide, so many end users, so many technical tables, uh, so many business partners who has to work on this. It was a big question for us to make sure how do we complete this migration and how do we even start this migration. So the first thing we did, we invited Snowflake Professional Service to work with us for a four-week migration assessment. And what we did in migration assessment, we look at the overall existing system inventory. Everything from table level, from ETL jobs level, from the orchestration jobs level, what is the current technology roadmap? And does this technology roadmap fit into where we want to go? We are changing one of the foundation piece of our data platform, which is Snowflake. Does our existing tool set really work well with that? Does our tool set really meet our business value goal, which we have our end user? So we look from the technology angle. Moodley highlighted some of the data security challenges we had. So we reviewed all our existing security issues. We, re we reviewed all our data quality issues. And we also reviewed what kind of the operation overhead we have due to the not having the right governance in place. Along with these two technology lenses, we also look from the operation and the organization lenses. When you have a change such a big significance uh, level, you need to look from the change management. There are 
10,000 plus users who are going to use this new platform. What is changing for them? What do they need to know about that change? How it is changing for them? And why it is changing for them? So they need to understand what is the value this is bringing to them. So we reviewed uh, from that lens as well. And then finally, we are a big company. We, this platform is going to support 16 stakeholders. And all the stakeholders, all those business, they have their own uh, different priority for their annual goals. Finance team, they want to build a new finance system. They want to move from Oracle ERP to uh, Workday. So how do we ensure that the priority of this program is aligned with the priority of all those business programs? And how do we ensure that the sequencing of migration, which we have to do for each data mart, is not actually having any clash with their timeline, and it's actually based upon a very nice balanced dance between their release and our release. So depending upon all these four lenses, we actually made some major decision as part of our migration. And once we finished the assessment, all the output from the assessment was a huge help for us for many purposes. First of all, it gave us a blueprint what our future migration will look like. It allowed us to get the alignment from our uh, IT leadership. It allowed us to get the alignment with our business leadership. It actually allowed us to work very effectively on our RFP process with our different service partners. And finally, actually, we had a very good partner, Deloitte, which we selected for this uh, migration. So that assessment, I will highly recommend if you are going into such kind of a complex migration, to spend some time in the beginning on the assessment. So after the assessment, these are the, some of the steps and some of the decisions we have to make. With level of complexity which we had, we decided to start the whole migration process with a small pilot. We choose a small data set where we want to see if we have to re-architecture the whole system, how much effort it will take to do the migration. So we choose one of our smallest and simplest data set, and we try to migrate it using the re-architecture approach. When I say re-architecture approach, we are already changing one of the key technology. But we also look at, hey, if there is any opportunity to change the table schema, if we can make our ETL jobs more effective and more optimized. Once we did the re-architecture migration for, uh, for one of the uh, pilot, we realized that it's much more complex than what we thought. So the, the lesson learned here is you should always have some kind of uh, pivot strategy in your migration, and you should always start with the pilot so that you can see, hey, what you are thinking, does it make sense practically or not? Given the complexity we realize in our re-architecture effort, we decide to take a lift and shift approach. What we do in the lift and shift, think of like you are moving from one house to another. Rather than deciding which furniture will go into which room in the new house, hey, let's make sure we are not paying the rent for the old house. Let's move everything into the new house. And then slowly we decide where the furniture has to go in the which room. So that's the same strategy we decided for our migration. In our level of complexity, I think it was one of the best decisions we make. If we had to continue with the re-architecture, project will probably take three to four years. And I hope all of you know that when the project is so long, IT leaders, BU leaders, they all start losing their patience, and sometimes there is funding issues as well. So based upon all the constraints we had, we started the journey with the left and shift. The second major decision we had to make was, hey, once we are doing the migration cutover, should we do it a big bang? or should we do it through the iterative approach where we are first migrating, let's say, HR data mart, then marketing data mart, and the finance data mart. One of the key reasons for us to decide to go on the iterative here is, as I was saying earlier, there is like 16 stakeholders. They had all their own priority. So they cannot wait for us to finish this migration and not to do any enhancement in the existing system. To make sure we have the right balance between existing system enhancement and the migration, we decide to go with the lift and shift. Uh, sorry, the iterative one. In case you have a simple migration and your business stakeholders are not large stakeholders and they can wait for you, I will suggest you should look at the Big Bang because it can reduce the complexity at a very, very high level. Now, other than these two, these are the other three things which I feel is very, very important for any migration. Uh, in our case, when we start working with the Snowflake Professional Service and with our service integrated partner, Deloitte, we start looking at some of the accelerator. We had like more than 3,000 ETL job. We don't want to convert them manually. Can we use some accelerators to automatically convert those? 
No accelerator will give you 100% conversion. But even if you can get 30%, 60% conversion using these tools, that drastically reduce the overall timeline for your migration. We look at some other tools. Data has to move as well. Once the data is moving from old platform to the new platform, can we use some automation to do the validation so that our end business user doesn't have to spend a lot of cycles to do that validation manually? And last, there's a tool uh, we are using which is actually using AI uh, also going to validate our reports using the pixel by pixel conversions and comparing them. We can see if we have to manually call our business user to do any reports validation or not. So at, at highlight here is use as much accelerator, as much automation as you can do. The next point is very important too. As I was highlighting, there was like 16 stakeholders. Uh, they have their own priority. And when you have a migration project like this, it's only the migration team which feel that this is the highest priority for them. All other business units, they have their own business priority. So how do you ensure that they also look at the project with the same priority as you are? That's where the alignment between your leadership, IT leadership, or the data team leadership, and the business unit, uh, leadership is very, very important. Along with this alignment, you also need to make sure they're informed about all the things which you are doing in the migration. For example, in our case, when we were migrating HR data mart, we started with having the different checkpoints. That was our the first data mart which we were migrating. So starting from the beginning, we ensure that starting at the executive level, to the lower level in that organization. That business team is part of the migration team itself. They are not the consumer of the system. They are the partner in this migration. We ensure that when we started our scrum journey as part of the first migration, they're joining our design session. They're part of our code review. When we are doing the UAT, they're part of our UAT uh, uh, team. When we're doing the cutover, they're work sitting with us during the cutover and they're making sure that things are working as smooth after the migration is done. The last and very, very important part is the change management. With a project of this size and this complexity, it's very important you include all the regular change management practices here. I was highlighting the pilot, that's one of the practices you should do. Along with that, let's make sure that the change management team is highlighting what are the changes coming in the next couple of months. There is regular communication going about all the critical timelines. There's regular communication going about what is changing. There's regular communication going about how they have to use it. And then finally, enablement. When you have a user such a big size, 10,000 plus user, you need to ensure that when the new system is live, they know how to effectively use it. That's why we created a lot of trainings. We created center of enablement. We have office hours where they can come and visit our office hours and they can ask us the question about the new systems. So overall, I would say these are some of the best practices which were very helpful for us. And I will highly recommend if you start your migration journey to look at these angles very, very seriously. So if you have attended uh, Gartner conferences recently, they started throwing this uh, term or their franchises. Um, I hope uh, you all know what that means. But fr from uh, Salesforce's perspective, we are using similar philosophies for a while now. We talked about how self-service was adopted and, and, and practiced and so forth. So from Salesforce's point of view, um, we believe in one central data platform that will cater to different persona of developers, uh, data developers or data teams. So on this slide, you see uh, on the right side, you have IT data teams leveraging the same you know, uh, data platform. We also have uh, self-service business users um, that um, we, we want this, uh, them to use the same uh, central data platform. Within the IT teams, we have uh, a decentralized model where uh, we have data teams that are uh, uh, more aligned with the business uh, unit specific uh, of functions. And uh, on the self-service side, we have somewhat decentralized, somewhat centralized, uh, so we have a mix there. But we expect all of them to use uh, the, the, the same data platform. That's our vision, that's our goal, that's what we are trying to go towards. So as you can see, Salesforce is, uh, um, uh, we, we talked a lot about self-service. Um, we, we believe in uh, um, uh, empowering our business users to um, you know, make quick decisions and go, go to market um, in, a, in a timely manner and so on and so forth. So I'm sure some of you have uh, 
uh, uh, being exposed to self-service or uh, you know, provided self-service capabilities to your business users. Raise your hand if you are in that state. Anybody? Self-service? And how did that end up? Did, did it, uh, was it successful or was it uh, more, uh, did it lead to wild, wild west? Did it expose more risks? You know, things like that. These, so these are some questions, right? So these are the same questions that we have been asking as well. And so, um, you know, over a period of time, we kind of came up with uh, um, a formula um, that we'd like to share with you guys. And it's a six-step formula on how to make an impactful self-service. First step is to make sure that everybody is using uh, consistent tooling. That includes uh, all the business users. We did not have that situation before, where teams were using their own tooling and so forth. So this is when IT, which is what uh, me and Vikas are part of, uh, we stepped in and we are now providing consistent tooling for the business users to start using. When we started my, uh, modernizing our tool set, we actually included our business users in these evaluations. And we wanted to, for them to have a say so that it will fit the strategy. They will be easily um, you know, ready to come on board and so on and so forth. So providing consistent tooling, ensuring everybody is on the same tooling is very important. Second is data catalog. Um, one of the reasons why some of the self-services uh, turn into data silos and you know, uh, decisions being made, um, informed, uninformed, et cetera, is because you do not have a, uh, a proper data catalog where people can go find what, what a business term means, what a business metric means, where to even go find um, your delinquency metrics. What's the source, authoritative source of truth for that? Where do you find that? Um, so the data catalog is a place where you should work towards enabling that for the business users so that uh, you're enabling discovery, data discovery and so forth. Very crucial. Um, and then because it's a shared space where multiple teams are coming in and they're all using same tooling and so forth, it makes sense for, um, for us to create some reusable frameworks so that um, they are reusing than recreating. And especially in self-service area, you don't want them to recreate because they're solving some quick business problems, right? So you want, you want them to get to the problem statement as quickly as possible, then deal with all the other noise that they shouldn't have to deal with. So that's where reusable frameworks come in. From an IT org perspective, we are uh, working towards enabling and empowering them with that. And step four is to create a, um, a sense of community. Um, you know, it starts with onboarding. You know, when you're onboarding these business users onto the platform, you handhold them through, the, through that process. Um, and, and that's what we do. Daniel here, he, uh, he's part of my team, he's here. His team is responsible for um, uh, onboarding uh, people through that process, and, and, and Rahul as well. And, and so we, we work with them to, um, um, you know, make sure that they understand what needs to be done what are the tooling, what is the training, um, and, and we document all these steps um, you know, in, a, uh, in a confluence page. We have training videos, training material, and stuff like that that, um, uh, that they would uh, uh, tap into. And, uh, um, uh, and then we don't stop at that. We actually have office hours on a, uh, on a weekly basis where people come in um, and ask their ad hoc questions, and we handhold them through that process as well. Ultimately, we create a sense of community. You know, we have events such as like quarterly data days, Tableau days, where um, uh, we bring all these folks together. They share their best practices. They share their lessons learned, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and, and that actually helps them come together and, and uh, you know, be there for each other. Now, all of this are uh, not going to help you any bit um, if you don't have the right policies, right rule book for, uh, uh, for the self-service uh, platform. So you need to create that self-service platform. I'm going to speed up because I got a five-minute warning. So, um, so it's very important to create the rule books and make sure that people 
uh, have something to uh, you know, guide them uh, for them to be following those guardrails and so forth. And then step six, enabling uh, uh, these folks uh, for easy governance. Some of the instances we are actually enabling them to self-govern those spaces and make sure that uh, uh, you know, we're doing audits and they're able to do audits and so on and so forth. I know in the interest of time, we'll skip the last slide. I'll just highlight it, but I'll skip the uh, last two slides, actually. Uh, this is something that uh, I'll quickly touch on. It's a self-service lifecycle. Imagine a business user who is wanting to uh, do some quick um, uh, you know, problem solving and ad hoc problem solving. We create this uh, ecosystem for them to come in and leverage a sandbox environment where they can build stuff. And then that, you know, whatever they built, maybe their CFO likes it so much that they might want that data to be available to them on a weekly basis or daily basis for the next few months. So they need a space for that. They can't come to IT and then IT cannot drop everything to accommodate that. So that's what the left side, bottom left side is talking about, how that can be operationalized for a brief period of time where uh, then the business users and IT teams can work together and push it into the top box, which is EDWR. Um, so ultimately, it's, it becomes fully operational, productionalized, and properly supported. Uh, I'll, I'll just uh, put this up for uh, people to consume, but uh, uh, we'll pause uh, uh, our talk for any questions. Anybody has any questions? Yeah, go ahead. How you manage the MDM solution in the platform? Like, do you have any specific set of tools, or like it's an inbuilt platform? It's actually a work in progress. Okay. Um, so we we have picked a tool. Um, we picked Informatica, and we're working. Um, it's a, it's a, as we speak, it's happening. So we are building all the master data uh, pipelines, etc. Thank you. Yeah, from the tomb angle, we are using Informatica too. Right. Murli, there's a question. Welcome. Does Salesforce have a plan to extend the Snowflake platform to do data sharing between customers to, and yourselves to be able to get data that way instead of flat file transfers that we get things from now? So that can you talk about data sharing instead of uh, flat file transfers and stuff? Yeah, like. so that's the main one of the major goal we have with our data cloud and Snowflake integration as well. So if you store the data in Iceberg, and if your metadata is can be, uh, so right now we are, it's not a feature which is readily available either from Snowflake or Data Cloud, but the vision is if you're storing the data in S3 and if you use Iceberg as a catalog system and you can store the metadata either in Snowflake or in a separate uh, outside of Snowflake, let's like say in Data Cloud we are supporting Hive and all those uh, metadata, and you have the federated metadata level synchronization happening between that, once you have all those inbuilt, you should be able to use the data from any of those two systems. There's no need to actually move the data between the system. And even data cloud is actually promising the same thing uh, from the Salesforce perspective. You have data in, let's say, sales cloud. Using the data cloud, you don't have to build a lot of custom ETL job. Using the data cloud, you should be being able to that data into data cloud directly. We have one question here. Yeah. There's, a, there's a question here to Murphy. A couple of questions. Uh, during the migration process, number one is like, how did you validate data? Just I know there was change management, and you also said there was some AI tools where there was pixelated comparison for reporting. That's good, but data validation. So there are three level of uh, tools we used. Uh, and some of those were provided by our SI partner, Deloitte. We do have uh, Richard here representing Deloitte. Uh, so two tools focus mostly on the validation. One is on the data validation once we migrate it and just compare the data from the old system and the new system. And then there is an AI tool for the reports. We have like tons of uh, Tableau reports. Once let's say everything is migrated, reports should not change ideally. So what this tool does, it just does the image comparison pixel by pixel, and if there's any change, then we involve the business user. But the third tool is not for the validation, it's for the migration, for the automatic conversion. Currently, we use Informatica Power Center, and we are moving into Informatica IACS. So rather than doing the manual conversion, uh, again, Deloitte has built some automation tools. Snowflake has some tools as well. We're leveraging both of those tools to do the automatic conversion. We'll come to you, I promise. Okay. Um, 
So after you made the decision to do a lift and shift rather than re re-architecture all your data um, upon migration, I mean, do you plan on kind of revisiting that and re-architecturing uh, re it down the road? Yeah. And if so, I mean, yeah, yeah. what's that process look like? No, definitely. So when I say we decide to choose lift and shift, probably I should have been more clear. Lift and shift we are calling is the phase one. Let's not pay the rent for the old house. Let's move into the new house. Once we move to the new house, we have to still make sure we're re-architecting the whole ecosystem based upon the modern architecture, based upon the modern tools and everything. But right now, the goal of the migration initially was how quickly we can move, how we can enable the business to use Snowflake so they can leverage the time to the market much more faster. But once they have moved, after that, it's each BU can by themselves actually put their effort into the re-architecture. So that's the approach we took. It's like a two-phase approach. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you.